Welcome back to another episode of Spotlight on the Arts, an independently produced show sponsored in part by the Chicopee Cultural Council and Chicopee TV. My name is Johnny Miranda, your host for the evening, and today we have a great show. We meet poet and writer Maurice Taylor. Let's hear more from him up next. <laughs> Welcome back to Spotlight on the Arts. I am Johnny Miranda, your host, and we are here with writer, poet, and an amazing artist, creator, Maurice Taylor. Maurice, thank you for joining us in our show today. You're welcome, man. Thank you for having me. It's I appreciate been a, it. It's been, a, it's been a while where we've been trying to get a hold of you and have your talent here <laughs> at our studio. Um, you're a poet. You are also writer of many other things, and you have a recovery group. Yeah, it's 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 man, it's it's a lot. Um, like you said, a poet. Um, I started out as a rap artist, lyricist. Um, by the time I became old enough to really get into it, right, the landscape changed for being more corporate versus cultural and uh, hip hop, and it went from I'm gonna put my mask back on, um, sure. and it, and it went from um more positive to more negative and violent and understanding why over the years in terms of who started controlling the message right um i decided to go into spoken word because that's where you can be more conscious and more positive and really address real issues um i have a history i call myself a grassroots cultural organizer um because i grew up in foster care i grew up in orphanages and the pain that I experienced in that, right? It felt like, you know, trying to get support and help as a child was really impossible. I felt invisible. And I wanted to like help stop that. You know, I wanted to help get a, a voice to those in pain, those are hurting. I wanted to create a space where people can uh, become hip hop artists and be themselves without, you know, trying to rise to the occasion of being, uh, um, what do you call it, an alter ego right. um, that is encouraging pain and destruction in our communities, you know, because that's what that's what has become. That's what has become. And so um, I created Portic Recovery because, you know, like I said, you know, when I was younger, I came into recovery. I didn't want to be rhyming about, you know, killing people, robbing people, disrespecting the women of our communities. Um, so I would create that space so that um, we can embrace you know, we can talk about the things that we went through without glorifying it, right? Um, we can teach the lessons, you know. Um, our culture was our therapy, right? Um, if you look at, like, you know, the history of slavery, one thing that kept us together was our music, our song. Definitely. You know, going through all that. And if you, you look at it, right, for a whole... It seems like to me that all the way up into the 80s, we were able to push back from the oppression because we had control of our music. Now that the industry has control of the music, um, the control of our economics, it's like we don't really have a, our own voice anymore. And so for me, Portic Recovery was to help change that narrative so that we can control our voices, so that we can find ourselves, so that we can recover ourselves. Also for me, um, much props to the 12 steps, but if I tried to address racism within those meetings, you know, there would be pushback, frustration. Um, if I say, you know, hey, I don't believe in God, you know what I'm saying? Or I don't call my creator God because, you know, it comes from a Greek word God, which means invoked one. It doesn't go back far enough with our ancestral beliefs and concept of who or what God is. So why should I accept something that denounces who we are? You know what I'm saying? A whole half of the world. You know what I'm saying? So to me, I don't think my creator would want that. And so Poetic Recovery is about giving people space to really uncover all of this stuff, right? And uh, bring out all the pain and trauma, 
you know, from all this stuff so we can push forward. You know, so that's that's been, you know, my life's work pretty much, you know. So how, how long ago did you start uh, the Poetic Recovery Group? Well, it's funny, before Poetic Recovery, I started Community Against Hate because I was a um, youth organizer at the Rise for Social Justice until it come, cr came crumbling down with all the racism that was happening on the board and stuff like that. More black people, um, brown, black and brown people became at the board of Arise at that point in time. And you had white folks coming to the board to tell us what to do, right? And so it was really an internal mess. Um, I had people, you know, from there going to colleges telling them not to bring me back to perform anymore. So I started creating my own thing, which was Community Against Hate, which was gonna be an organization to educate hip hop artists about social political issues. Um, but the thing is, is that like, there was no place to perform, you know, for where people would support conscious artists. So I went from Community Against Hate to Poetic Recovery. Meanwhile, at this time, I was the president of African American Cultural Society at stake. You know what I'm saying? When I was going to school for computer, um, computer uh, system engineering, which I never got a job in. So, I mean, dealing with all this racism in the society, um, I felt like we needed something to help us grow, and that could be our culture. Right. You know, so uh, I don't know if I failed or what, man, but it's, it's been hard, bro. You know? a, I mean, I think that, that the fact that you found yourself limited in, in terms of your platform uh, or where to present your work and that you went and created your own and created your own avenue, I think that yeah. that is very admirable in artists. And I Thank think it you. happens often when we don't have a, a, a venue or, or an avenue to express our work, we create our own. I mean, creators we are. Yeah. Um, how do individuals that are interested in your recovery group, how do they get to be a part of it? Um, well, before COVID, we was doing open mics at um, Make It Springfield. We used to go all over Western, well, any, any place that would have us, right? Yeah. Um, but right when COVID hit, man, we did a show that was packed. It, it was packed. It was like it was it was the dopest thing, right? The craziest thing is I got the video footage, but I didn't record the audio. Oh, <laughs> it happens. Oh man, I was like, what? But um, to 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 answer your question, um, so from there I took it online, so that you know during COVID, so that people can be connected. You right. know, I can only do it for a year after that. My funds ran out, and I was like, ah. But um, I created a social network called PorticRecovery.us because it's not about me, it's not about you, it's about us, right? right? So if you go to PorticRecovery.us, you can actually sign up and register and become a member of this website where you can communicate and connect with other people, create a business page, and promote the business that you do. Um, or you can download Portic Recovery Radio app on Google Play uh, apps on the um, app uh, the app store on Apple um, on your on your uh, 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 iPhones, um, and you have access to our online uh, online radio station. Now the way that that works is I get um, audio from I get music from individual artists. Um, they submit their music, and then if it goes by the criteria, we'll put it on the radio station. Nice. What that does is give people the ability to listen to music with good messages and stuff like that. And, you know, because the process of recovery is hard, man. And, yeah. and music, for me, kept me alive. And so I hear other people saying that, but there's really not a place where you could really find positive artists because people don't feel like there's money in it, right? And so I've made it my business to give voice to these artists, but also as a foster child, this platform is also built for the foster child who's been abused and need to speak and need to be heard, right? Especially for the black foster child that's invisible, mm -hmm. you know, so. And I, and I understand that the themes of, of, of your writing uh, tend to be more on the social, social side, advocacy, bringing these social problems to the light. Um, how is your creative process? How do you 
decide how you're going to write or how you're going to, is it all spontaneous? Uh, do you just get the muse and, and, and write right at the moment? How is that creative process for you? It's actually a mix, right? I used to do what I call, uh, um, oh, I can't even think, uh, pick poetry, okay. right? Where I see a pick on your social media profile, I hit you up, be like, yo, can I, I like that, you know, translate this into a poem. And you'd be like, yeah, all right. I did that for a few bodybuilders, female bodybuilders. Nice, nice. Um, I did one for um, uh, Tony. Um, he's, a, he's a famous comedian. He gave me permission to use his picture to do a poem. Houdini gave me permission nice. to do a poem. And so I did pick poetry with them as well. Um, and man, so that was really interesting. That was challenging for me. I also go on stage and I get words from the audience and I do an improv. Right. And then other times it's when things are happening, man. It's like, yo, this, nobody sees that's the problem. Right. Like domestic violence right. is a big problem. Right now, if you're a woman and you're trying to get out of a domestic violence situation, there are no beds available right now. They will actually tell you to go back home or they will encourage you to go back home. I know that because I actually just dealt with the situation of helping a young woman um, in a domestic violence situation. And on more than one occasion, the question was, can you go back home? After she didn't told him, like, he knows where I live at, right? He knows where my mom lives at. I need to get out of town. So, you know, I'm, I'm looking at that. And, and when I challenge my own issues with women from being abused by men and women, raped and molested as a child, I have to go through my own experience and, and push past, like, why do I want to help people that don't want to help me? And then I got a member of the women that loved me that I wasn't even their child. And they loved me, right, unconditionally because they knew my situation. And so thinking about them, if they were in that situation, how would I feel? You know what I mean? So that's, you know. And when you encounter these individuals that are going through a tough time, um, how, or if, if you do, how do you motivate them to utilize words and poetry as a means to recover from their traumatic experiences. Well, so when people find their way to open mic, usually promoted through social media or word to mouth. Um, if there's a small crowd, right, we'll pick a topic. We'll discuss the topic, which allows us to open up, right? to deal with that feeling of like, yo, I want you in my business, right? Mm -hmm. And open up and start addressing those issues. So if you bring up a topic, then okay, yo, why did you bring up that topic? And then we listen to you. And based on how we interact with what you said, we write it down. One, it gives us the ability to listen, mm -hmm. right? Two, it allows you to interact with how we interpreted what you stated. And you're in that room, you're interacting with three or four other people, right? And now they're all interacting with each other's interpretation of what was said. We realize that we're not all right, all right, we're not all wrong. There's much more to what's going on, right? And then it allows an avenue for us to connect. Right. It creates a basis for us to, to, to build. So the work is not for today. The work is for down the line. I may be dead and gone when it actually builds an actual community of people who've learned to trust each other again. Mm -hmm. I know that, that um, you mentioned earlier uh, how you started first rapping and, and being a lyricist and, and kind of impro improvising. When it comes to the art of improvisation, how do you prepare for that? I don't, I don't know, bro. I'll be honest with you. Just the gift. Listen, man, I remember when I was like 15, 16 on uh, uh, Main Street, was it Main, North Street in Pittsville, Massachusetts, and uh, uh, maybe I was a little bit older because I remember being homeless and we was um, chilling with brothers on the street. I was chilling with brothers on the street. Um, and we was just freestyling. And I found it very hard. And like someone's like, well, just, just, 
you know, rock about what you see. I see buildings, the street, and cars on the streets. Yo, one day I really want to teach. I see the mountains, the sky is dark blue. What am I going to do for you? You know, and I had to just start from there. Whereas, like, for you it might not make sense, but for me it was the beginning of a process. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? And it makes sense, uh, as they told you, to just start out by what you see. Yeah, well, actually, that was an idea I had in my mind, right? And so, like, even today, like, if I started rhyming about all this, like, I don't know the intricacies of all this. So I just, you know, do what I feel is important. Like, you know, the people that built the industries year way back before, people that fought to get unions so they can get paid a livable wage, yo. Now we got a stage, we got the lights, camera, action. I'm going to be the attraction. You know what I mean? Nice, nice. <laughs> yeah, I think that, that, that also uh, being aware of your culture, your surroundings, staying informed, but reading and increasing your vocabulary can allow oh, for an easier improvisation process oh, I, when it comes to writing. Absolutely, man. A absolutely. And, you know, I always take people, there's two things. I want, I want to say this is really important because I've, ta I've taught um, hip-hop workshops, poetry hip-hop workshops. Um, Eli's Brookings, uh, I co-created the peace programs with um, Gianna Allen Tuck. And the reason why I did that is because at that point in time, it was the most violent area in Springfield. And there was a um, psychiatrist that they brought in to do, to figure out, like, what's going on. And then so, like... She told me that, like, I don't know. I mean, I'd be connecting with these higher up people. It's weird that people wouldn't even believe that actually talks to me, right? And um, she was telling me, like, that they're just medicating these students. They're not really, you know, bringing them through a process. So when I got the chance, um, I tried to do events at churches and stuff. Like, they was like, nah, you ain't doing nothing here, right? And so um, James... Uh, Ilibos, I can't really pronounce his last name. He was just, he was actually a media person a couple of years ago before he left, before he left out the news. Um, but then he was a child and he was doing an anti-violence program. And I was like, he put out this flyer, but it didn't really look right. And I asked him, I was like, yo, do you want help with this? He was like, yeah. So I created him a flyer. He was like, yo, that's cool. I was like, no doubt. And I was like, well, who are you going to have speak there? He goes, what do you mean? I was like, well, you can't just have people show up, speak. Like, what if I helped you bring a hip hop pioneer? What's that? Someone who helped create Hip Hop Pioneer, who knows that it wasn't this violent thing. He was like, yeah, that would be cool. So I had Little Rodney C from Funky Floor Plus One More come up. They did a Stop the Bombs rap years ago, back in the seven, or back in the 80s, right? Wow. So he came up, and he was standing with the kids encouraging stopping the violence, something that they've never had done, like in, in the city where Hip Hop Pioneers are out there with us, right? And so I wanted to help him with that and give him and encourage that, you know what I'm saying? And, and, it, and it really helped out. And so they did another event and he asked me, um, yo, would you like to come and do some poetry? I was like, yeah, absolutely. You know, so I did and I did this improv where I got words from the um, commissioner, the mayor, people in the audience and stuff like that and did this whole poem, um, which included police brutality, right? And they were pretty much amazing. Gianna was like, would you, would you be willing to help come teach the kids? And out of that, peace came, and the, the mayor's task force supported it, and it was it was a big yeah, deal, bro. It was a big yeah. deal. No, and um, and it's definitely, it's definitely a, a, a way to reach youth when yeah. you are not when you're bringing a lesson, but also incorporating a topic that they are uh, very interested in. So, yeah. in order to engage them with with the message and engage them with writing and poetry. Mm -hmm. What better way than, than than incorporating the culture of hip hop, the history of hip hop, into it? Well, we also gotta we also gotta connect the real issues into it. Yes. You know, we see like how Florida is uh, trying to take Black history out of schools and stuff like. Right. That. It's also happening here too, right? Because I remember going to school learning about Black history and y'all is you know, a slave with a with a with a with a stick and a knapsack on the back running away from slavery. But our history was so much more vast than that, right? And so we got problems on both sides. And, and the issue that I found is that when I, you know, teach about these hard issues and stuff like that, they don't want to bring me in because of their fragility, right? And if white folks on the left are held accountable, man, they talk to you like, like they sound like they're on the right wing. 
Right. And so I've had to deal with all that, right? You know what I'm saying? And, and it's really disheartening because it really blocks true um, evolution. You know what I'm saying? And so I think we need to come to a point where, um, you know, right now, this country is polarized, where the, the right and the left is pointing fingers at each other. And I like to tell people, like, there's racism on both sides. It's just expressed differently, right? Where you have the bigotry, want to call you the N-word, want to show you a noose, but the other will just systematically keep you out again at work and to pat you on the back, mm -hmm. right? It all, it's all killing our communities, like the bogus drug, on war on drugs, right? And we see the aftermath of that right now, right? right. Um, I think we need to talk about all of this stuff so we can learn from it truly, right? Definitely. Black, white, Latino, Asian, wherever we at as human beings because it impacts us all. And once we talk about it and get through those feelings because as, as you know, black and brown folks, right? We live through these feelings every day, right? And so when someone's come from a community that's benefiting from these pains, right? And all we asking you to do is just listen to our story. If you can't just do that, how can you call yourself an ally? Correct. You know what I'm saying? Right. And so for me, um, I keep teaching these um, workshops and these programs uh, wherever I can because we need to get to that point where we can truly have a table where we can all express everything and put it in the gumbo pot, right? Because out of that comes a solution. You know what I'm saying? And I hope we can get to that point, whether the person... I've had people say, well, why are you talking to a Republican? Because when I was at West Coast State, it wasn't a Republican that forced me out of school from a, a computer system engineering degree to a liberal studies, right? When I went to the bathroom when they had Obama's a monkey on the wall and I went to the um, chair of the department that wouldn't deal with it, I had to go directly to the president because I wanted to, um, you know, do our own video for the hip hop program and they wanted white folks to tell us what to do when they don't do that, they wasn't doing that to other people, right? I had issues with that. Or I got kicked out as the, um, the hip hop music director, you know, um, and, you know, the, the director, you know, was telling my business to other students to push me out because I was pushing back against the racism because one of the, um, the uh, advisors who was a professor there um, asked me to go to Urban Ed and speak to them because I was black. I was like, you do know that there's white folks in urban ed too, so white folks from here can go to there, right? Um, and when a professor told me that I threatened her, you know what I'm saying? That's when I knew something bad was gonna happen to me at that school. Yeah. So I had to leave campus, and I'm gonna tell you, no matter who I went to, no matter what status they were, black or white, in that school, I got no support. And it's, um... Well, no, that's not true. Someone did help me write up my complaint. But that's about all the support I got. It's, uh, it, it's sad how uh, there are many talented individuals out there that want to express certain topics and want to say things in the way that they see fit comes yeah. to them in their creative nature. And as an artist, when your creativity is limited or stomped, uh, that takes a toll on on your future creative process. It, it, it does, bro, listen, like, if I would have, my GPA was three point something, right? 3.3 .3 or whatever, right? That's not bad, right? Not bad. Um, I was asked to be on the Model UN team at Westville State by the professor Steinberg, who was part of the Clinton administration, right? Bro, you don't just go and ask anybody. So I did that two years, one year I couldn't because I had no money, right? But I did it for two years. So how I go from being a computer information systems student with like a semester or more to go, right, to a liberal studies degree, 28,000, 78,000. We be focused on black folks that are being murdered by police, right, only as Black Lives Matters, but not about the lives of the black folks that are being systematically stumped, mm -hmm. right? You know what I'm saying? And we need to re, re, um, refocus our aim, right, and protect those who are being systematically, you know, stopped. It's like these microaggressions. Right. Once we start at the microaggressions, right, then we can prevent all these huge things from happening. 
You know what I'm saying? And so I hope that with my story, with the work that I'm doing, I hope one that we can start listening to the pains on a very real level, not just when someone becomes a, um, a rich athlete or performer yeah. and then use their pains to say to other people, well, if they can do it, you can do it as so as to be like, well, we don't have to change society. You just need to toughen up because the reality is, is like most people don't make it mm -hmm. right. People fall to drugs, alcoholism, you know, what I'm saying mental, you know, no. mental issues and stuff like, that. you know, what I'm saying. And there's not enough services to really help everybody. You know what I'm saying? And so we really do need to really look at like, yo, do we change society? And how do we do that? You know, and one of the people, one, one of the artists that I really loved when I was younger was um, Chanel O'Connor. Um, when she did Nothing Compares to You. And I listened to that song and I was like, I would love for somebody to feel that way about me. You know what I'm saying? And as an adult, she just passed, right? But as an adult, you know, um, remembering back to when she tore up the Pope's picture the Pope, yeah, that, I on SNL. That was world news. Yes, was man. Just... And then that that helped lead to the them doing all those investigations and stuff like that, and then coming out like, oh, the Pope knew about you know these children being molested in, in the church. You know what I'm saying? She was she was huge, bro. You know what yeah. I'm saying? And so the work that she did influences me. You know what I'm saying? And it definitely no. shows how the how there is power in words yes. to speak up about injustice and to uh, speak up about our internal processes mm -hmm. and how that is affecting us. But then looking at it from a macro perspective, look the at, story of one individual is a reflection mm -hmm. of an entire society. Look at Public Enemy. Right. Look at uh, let's go back to uh, what was it, Grandmaster Flash and First Five that did the message. Don't push me cause I'm close to the edge. I'm trying not to lose my head. <laughs> He's saying, bro, I'm fed up, man. Please, I can't deal with your mess today. Can you please give me space? Which is a whole lot different today than like, yo, I'm gonna kill you. Right. You feel what I'm saying? Like, you know what I mean? And, and Oh, I miss the days of Heavy D and the boys, man. Now that we found love, what are we going to... You know what I'm saying? That like nostalgia, yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. man, you know what I'm saying? And then uh, one of the things I teach my students, and I'm sorry for rambling on, but one of the things I teach students in the workshop is like, yo, so if you was walking down the street and somebody was like, your mom, you got a fat ass to your, to your mother, or your sister, how would you feel? Yo, man, I'm going to see them. They're going to have to see me, yo. I'm like, so why is it okay if you do it? What do you mean? Well, if you're playing this music, then you're creating a culture where your mother and sister has to actually walk down the street and be treated like that. Right. So if that's what you're rhyming about, that's what you're promoting. And when, you, when, you, when the women in your life that you claim to love have to go through that, you're responsible for that. And then when they leave my class, they're like, yo, I never thought about it like that. Yeah. You know? I mean, it, it goes to, sh to, to speak on what you were mentioning earlier on how this, the, the, the industry has taken over and it's all about capitalizing on money. Well, and if that message is what's producing them money, they are perpetuating that message as well, opposed to... Not just, it's not even just that. We can't just blame it on the industry because here's why. You remember when our community music school created the hip hop program like years ago? Okay. I helped create that program. I did the research for that program for Eric Backrack at the community music school. Where it started breaking down was um, William got sick. He had um, diabetes and he passed away. Um, and Eric Backrack wanted me to do the music part. And I'm like, bro, I don't know nothing about music. I brought a friend of mine in to meet him so we can both expand the class and do more. And so, because I didn't want to bring in Eminem, right, and teach the kids about Eminem, right, I got fired. Even though I did all the research for this class and came up with the name, you know, so on and so forth, right, and uh, I got the stories to prove it, right? I got pushed out because he didn't understand what hip hop culture was. And that's how it works, man, and that's sad. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And the reason why I didn't want to bring Eminem into the equation was because at that point in time, Eminem was promoting all this anger and 
all these vile like messages towards women, right? And I don't want to put these in the message of these kids' heads who's already having problems at home. You feel what I'm saying? Right. What I wanted to do was I, I started talking through the slave narratives. We wrote, we wrote um, was reading about the slave narratives. And the reason why that was important is because if all these people can go through this craziness and use their culture to stick together and build community, so can, so can you. And I was helping them see that there is a way out. You know what I'm saying? And so, but, you know, eventually I was fired. And then somebody else was brought in that wanted to do, that was willing to do what they wanted to do. And I'm not saying this to sh throw any shade on the, um, on the community music school, but this happens way too often, right? Whereas black folks that really want to build our communities you know, in the positions that we're in, right, are being pushed aside for those who are willing to do the bidding of those who don't even know our culture. Right. You know what I'm saying? And, and that aids the music industry, right? So it's not just the in music industry has all this power, right? These organizations are doing the bidding of the music industry or trying to suck up to the music industry to get funds and grants and stuff like that. Or they feel like that is what's going to keep these kids and... and, and you know, keep them interested. And then thing is, like, all these kids are doing is learning harm through that. Like, um, and are, like, I'm pretty sure that they got some good stuff out of it too. You know what I mean? But um, I'm pretty sure they don't really know our whole culture, which is the process I take them through and how hip hop really came to be. You know what I'm saying? And now I'm the Northeast Region Director of Hip Hop Congress. We're the second largest uh, hip hop network in, in the world um, with chapters within the U.S. and other countries, um, I do that work. You know what I mean? Um, we, we had a, a um, hip-hop uh, block party at, at UMass. I went and taught at UMass last year. Um, I'm, you know, working on connecting with other colleges in the area um, to uh, introduce people to Hip-Hop Congress, but also to poetic recovery to the work that I'm doing, you know? Right. So I think it's very important. Um, I'm not calling out any people, but we do have to shine light on what's happening that's really hurting our culture and our communities. Because sometimes people are doing this stuff and they're motivated by grants and funds, but it, has, it, it does have a negative impact in our communities and people. A lot of times we'd be like, yo, it's okay because like, yo, they're not hurting any. They're not hurting anyone physically, but it's like is the message that you're bringing an accurate depiction of what our culture is, and two, right? Yeah. What type of culture is it creating? You know what I'm saying? Right. And so, man, that's the work I need to do because as a foster child, like I said, like when you're a child and you're being abused in a home and no one really cares, how can you say that you live in a compassionate country or a country that cares. Right. We are as strong as you our know? weakest. Yeah. And um, and definitely what you are doing through your organization, Poetic Recovery in your group, and, and through uh, the expression of your art, I think that that has a healing component that is important. I think that our Absolutely. communities, more than anything, need to heal. It, and and your name, the name of your group, the Poetic Recovery, is is precisely a reflection of all that healing that our communities still need to do. And it also brings us, whether you've experienced domestic violence, I used to watch my mom get beat as a child, um, whether you're an addict, right, alcoholic, or whether you have mental illness, or whether like, yo, you just fed up with like your job, right? You can come in this space and it gives you the space to figure out why, right? I mean, think about like, it doesn't replace therapy or anything like that. I say, like, we're aid, you know, to that, right? But uh, you get, like, maybe two hours a month to sit with your therapist and maybe 15 minutes every three to six months with a psychiatrist who's pumping drugs in your body. Right. Right. We need something where people can really build and encourage each other to move forward. But the problem is a lot of people lack faith in themselves. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And there's a few reasons why. Well, you know, this society teaches you that you need to put all faith in God, not in each other, right? You need to put, you know, have faith in money, 
You know, people don't say have faith in money, but if you ain't got money, you can't get nothing, right? So the brain picks up that like, yo, money talks, BS walks, right? We, we, right. We've, been, we've been saying, we've, we've learned that since we was a kid, right? And so when you're poor and you go through so much trauma because you don't have money, right? We've already know God hasn't been there for us, you know, ever since we were children, right? So like how much faith do we have in our prayer, right? And uh, so we don't have all the things that we feel like that adds up to like, yo, some sense of freedom, right? And so we don't really put much into it, right. you know, and I want to help change that, you know what I'm saying? So you know? in order for you to continue making change and promoting change in our community, uh, we need more of your program in mm -hmm. different venues, different organizations, and we need the community support. We need the support of our culture mm -hmm. to make this happen. How can our community reach you? How can, where are you at right now? Where can people go see uh, the group? The fourth, the fourth Saturday of the month, we're at Make It Springfield from 6 okay. to 11. And actually this, uh, was it the 26th of this month, which is the fourth Saturday. Um, we got B-Boy Uni coming down and teaching a, a break dancing from 6.30 to 7.30. Nice. We're asking people to, you know, pay $25 for that because really like other break dancers are charging a heck of a lot more. You know what I'm saying? I want to pay him for his time. And normally I don't ask people for anything. Right. And then we're pushing towards going to. Uh, well, I, I used to do sliding scale, like donations and stuff like that. If you can get five, get five, you can get 50, get 50. You know what I'm saying? Um, because this is amazing work. This yeah. is great work. Right. It is and, amazing work. It definitely needs not just yeah. the support of our businesses, but it also needs financial support because a lot of the projects that we do, whether it's mural, whether it's uh, uh, the poetic group, whether it's uh, workshops that are artistically in nature, you know, related to, to promote recovery yeah. or to promote a social cause, we are all in need of funding and well, here, not a lot of it. Here's what's messed up. I've been doing this work for over 20 years in the areas, right? Now you got so many white-led recovery groups that are getting so much money to do the same thing that I haven't that been able to do. Yeah. yeah. And, and come on, man. Like, I sit back and I'm like, yo, is that a, like, accident? Right. That, um, it's, uh, it's something that, ha that, that happens, unfortunately, in, in a lot of our communities where, you know, we, we have creative individuals like yourself start programs and bring these ideas to light and, and, and then someone else comes with more funding and does a better, a greater thing and then you're, you're left. I don't know about greater, <laughs> but definitely a more funded thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, you know what I'm saying? Um, but you know what, I focus on, I, I really do, I really do try to focus on, and, and I'm, I'm impacted by trauma, right? When you talk about ACEs, adverse mm -hmm. childhood experiences, right? The more ACEs that you are as a child exposed to, the more likelihood you are to become an, an addict, go to jail, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I really do work on trying to focus on the things that have got me through all this stuff um, up to this date. And it's artists who really got something to say, Karis One. Mm -hmm. Not so much Karis One now because I think like, I think he, I don't know, I think, I think he's trying to stay relevant and sometimes as we try to stay relevant, we go off on the deep end, but I still think that he's pretty dope. I, th I still think he's incredibly dope. Um, so, but being able to meet with people like Johnny Juice, DJ Johnny Juice, a public enemy, you know, he let me come to his house and watch him scratch on the turntables, bro. I wanted to come home and just throw my turntables out, man. <laughs> and I've been using DJing as a way to bring communities together, not really make money. You know what I'm saying? Um, being able to be in the room with the co with um, Tony Crush, the co of the Cold Crush Brothers, who were the first rap group to go international. Um, being able to like bring pioneers to the area. Bro, I was bringing pioneers to the area like 15 years ago to speak to the youth. This organization was supposed to put up five hundred dollars and never did. That came out of my money, and wow. I and I was on uh, uh, food stamps. <laughs> I, did, I had to come up with that out of my SNAP benefits. You know what I'm saying? But we we need the support of organizations who are real about supporting us right. for this to really work. Right. right? We need community members to believe in themselves. Right. That's right. Um, 
But community members are only going to believe in themselves when we continue to do this cultural work, right? When people keep seeing artists who are really about it um, get shortchanged, when people who aren't really about it are getting all the support, the community loses faith in the process, right? right? So although these folks are getting money to bring kids and do all this stuff, right, they don't get, really get the back in the community, and they don't get the back in the community. Why? Because the community sees how they're, like, shortchanging the community. You know what I'm saying? And people that they love and respect for actually doing this work. You know what I'm saying? And so we have to change that. Um, I am grateful that I got a couple grants, you know what I'm saying? Um, which is why I was able to do, um, I got a cultural grant like about 10 years ago maybe, to be able to bring down DJs in Holyoke and teach the kids how to DJ. Yo, they were, they loved it so much, nice. man. It, it was so crazy. Well, maybe uh, up yeah. next we have... Um of uh, the Cultural Council, the Chicopee Cultural Council and the Mass Cultural Councils are opening grant season mm. uh, now in October. Okay. Um, so that is something you might want to look into. Absolutely, because I would get some funding to do these things, not man, just in I, Chicopee and Springfield, Holyoke. You're able to yeah. uh, do all of that. Well, no, it would be actually, it would be dope too, because I have um, DJ Johnny Juice on standby right now. He's actually working with, is it DMC from Run DMC? Okay. Um, it would be dope to bring him down here and teach DJing to, you know, to, to, to the whole community. You know what I mean? Right. I don't just say youth because it's like pimping our youth, right? You know yeah, what I'm yeah. saying? But like for the community, right? Because then that puts it back into the hands of our community. And what people don't realize is that the turntables replace the drums. Do you know they outlawed drums in uh, schools in the United States? Wow. Right. And so with the, the, the outlawing of drumming, right, came rise to something else, right? And that was, if, 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 you know what I'm saying? And so we always find a way. Right. You know what I mean? We always find a way. And I think that's one thing, if one thing that I could say to people to, help them have faith in themselves is that we always find a way. Yes, we do. We do. We always find a way. But we just can't keep walking, you know, in, in the dark, right? We have to, when we find our way, we have to make sure these doors are open for other people and not be so afraid to allow somebody else to come through the door. It's like being the only black person in the room and seeing another black person walking and be like, oh, damn, I'm not the only one. Now, nah, what's up, bro? How you doing? Mm -hmm. Welcome in the room. How do we get more people in? Right. You know what I'm saying? And not just because we're black, but because we're skillful and we bring that excellence to the table. You feel me? Right. So, Maurice, uh, how can our audience uh, book you, connect with you, tell us your Facebook information? How can people connect with you? Uh, I don't send people to Facebook. I send them to my own social media network. Okay. PoeticRecovery.us. PoeticRecovery.us. Um, if you download the radio station app, Portic Recovery Radio, on uh, app, um, on the iPhone, on your app store, right. or Google Play, uh, on the Play Store, Portic Recovery Radio, you'll see all of our networks that you can connect, you know, oh, there, connect there, to us. There you have it. There you have it. Right. Where you can connect with Maurice Taylor. And it's been an interesting conversation to learn Absolutely. about all of the social causes that, that he is impacting through his words and through his efforts in the community, his poetic recovery group, and, and definitely Maurice has a very interesting story to tell. I want to thank you for coming into our show, for highlighting some of the issues in our community that definitely need attention and to be put on the spotlight. And I thank you for creating an avenue where our communities can thrive and can heal through words. I definitely want to say I'm not alone, right? Um, we got support from Hip Hop Congress. We have support from Teaching Artists Institute now. Um, and uh, maybe next time you could bring me back and I can actually do a performance for you. Definitely. You're always You know welcome. what I mean? You know what I'm definitely. saying? So, you know. So there, we can rock there, that there out. you have it, Maurice is definitely going to be back in next time with a performance. All right. So once again, I want to thank you. I thank you, viewers, for watching. Thank you all very much. This is Johnny Miranda. I'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs> no, <it's not>. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs>